It's time you learned my history with Fire Lord Susie. I like that Aang in his dream here sees himself in his old outfit with no hair, as well as it being how he appears in the spirit world later in this episode as well. That does make you think though, if you show up as you picture yourself in the spirit world, why does Roku show up how he looked when he died? I guess it makes sense, you just kind of picture yourself how you are, but I'd probably want to be young Jack Roku personally. You actually can hear footsteps here that wake Zuko, but that still leaves the mystery of who left the note. It was Iroh who sent it, surely, but who has a connection with Iroh in the prison system that could have set this up? There's Ming, who as far as guards go is pretty pleasant, but past that, it doesn't seem like he has too many White Lotus visitors hanging around. More cloud bending. Aang actually does a similar move to one he does in the fortune teller, where he leans back and throws his arms over himself. Here we get a pretty wide shot of a wall of Fire Lord murals. So we actually get to see Sozin's father here, who was only ever mentioned once in the whole series later in this episode, and there's even an obscured portrait of Sozin's grandfather too. Also, these pictures actually illustrate the Fire Lord's rule too, or at least if you're looking at Sozin's it does. We've got the Comet and Firebenders at his feet, representing the army he unleashed during the Comet. There's not a lot more you can really glean from the portraits unless you're really looking to stretch, but it does look like Ozai's has machinery and stuff in it, so it could be that the Fire Nations made a lot of technological or industrial advances under Ozai's rule. Where is this on the island? It looks pretty uniformly messed up, but here we have this little alcove with this giant area shooting upwards. I thought for a second it might be something that Roku earthbent from later in this episode, but nah. That was up towards the summit of a volcano, and this looks like it's pointing out towards the ocean. It's interesting that Roku told Ang to meet him here on the day of the summer solstice, considering that Roku just straight up showed up that one time. It would lead me to believe that Ang still needs a spiritual place and date to speak with Roku. But this actually breaks some other rules as well. Roku and Ang couldn't keep talking because the sun set on the solstice last time. But here, he's meditating at sunset, and he stays with Roku all night. It could be that he's just better at it now, maybe opening his chakra help them out even though one is permanently locked right now we, we we won't get into that so it's still weird a lot of what i like about the spirit stuff is that it's vague and unknown but when you set up a hard and fast rule like this it's weird to contradict it and then just go back to following it there's a lot of comments that i get that are just people making excuses for the show with their own head cannon. you can do that all you want but i don't think it actually makes the show any stronger something i really do like from this moment though is that ang seems to go to the same mountaintop in the spirit world as the one that he went to back in book one when he first met roku what does it mean? Boy, that was strangely lucky. Usually Avatar is better than having things just coincidentally work out, but it's only once in a blue moon, so I'll let it slide. In the Dragonbone Catacombs. I would be remiss if I didn't mention how sick Dragonbone Dragon Catacombs! Catacombs sounds very nice to be entirely honest this isn't a very good locking mechanism right i mean not everyone's a firebender but there's a lot of them oh you son of a bitch they're making the full moon the focal point of the shot now it's like they're purposely antagonizing me from 13 years ago also this time lapse would have me believe that this fire sage didn't ever end up leaving he's probably still down there i guess zuko just got fed up of waiting dragonbone catacombs is right look at all these small dragon skulls that line this hallway even the ceiling and walls sort of seem like a spine with ribs coming off it maybe from an enormous dragon and we get a statue of Sozin that works at the door, so I think it's safe to say that this was built in Sozin's time, at Sozin's request, and it's not like a hyper ancient place. We get this lineup of what all seems to be equally important scrolls here, so it could be that these are the final testaments of Fire Lord's past, but if they go in order from left to right, we'd have Sozin's grandfather and father, Sozin, Azulon, and then Ozai, who's still alive. He might have already written one up, who knows, but to my knowledge, that dude's still alive, I think. Ah, it could be though that these are just general, important Sozin documents and not other final testaments. Once more, we get an entire episode set to flashing between Aang and Zuko, paralleling them, which I'm always down for, and we get some really cool shots and contrasts as well. So even though we've thoroughly treaded this ground, I'm down. <laughs> Looks like I win again, Roku. I haven't talked about how Avatar characterizes its characters in the first scene for a long time now, because we've kind of been introduced to everyone, but here we go again. Sozin is characterized awesomely. He's quick thinking, a little bit of a gamesman, but good natured overall. You also already get a feeling of his relationship towards Roku, as he says, I win again, but they're clearly both fine with that. You instantly know they're good friends, even before you even realize this is Sozin. The writing in the show is incredible, man. Say something to her. Uh... Oh. Even this tiny little detail of literally piling onto Roku is some real friend shit. Like, yeah, I'd probably do that to my friend if they just chickened out that hard. Just tiny little stuff like that goes so far. You think anyone ever caught Prince Sozin and Spectral Roku wearing the same headpiece in this scene the first time around? That would be some shit. Avatar Roku.
And even here, Prince Sosen shows a lot of humility by bowing to his friend who suddenly has this position of power, which is odd when you think about how proud the present royal family is. They do a really good job of making Sosen likable in a very short amount of time, and they had to, or else the emotional side of this episode wouldn't have worked. So hats off to them. Come on, show me how it's done using all four kinds of bending. Wow, that was pretty good. Like, I got a feeling that Sozin had a rough understanding of each kind of bending from that alone. And during peace times, that seems like it wouldn't be ordinary in a prince. Maybe he just likes fighting and studying how people fight. That's a pretty cool character trait. Here, I hope you're at least allowed to have this. But this is a royal artifact. It's supposed to be worn by the crown prince. I want you to have it. This is a big part of what makes this show so special to me. Friendships aren't explored enough in media. It's always romantic relationships that get the spotlight, but I think there's real merit in just showing friends who are really good friends. The kind of friend that can razz you when you mess up, but be there for you when you're down. Real friendships are just as fulfilling to watch on screen if you ask me, and Avatar is one of the few shows that give the viewer the chance to enjoy them. <sighs> Do they have bathrooms in the spirit world? As a matter of fact, they do not. This joke is a little tough to get, actually. This is a reference to when Sokka actually went to the spirit world himself. And the first thing he said when he got back was this. You were trapped in the spirit world for 24 hours. How are you feeling? Like I seriously need to use the bathroom. Hey, Gyatso, you want to see a new glider trick? Holy shit, did he just do a couple loops? I bet that's brand new. No one ever thought of that one. I can't believe you were friends with Monk Gyatso just like I was. Some friendships are so strong. They can even transcend lifetimes. Yeah, yeah, I'll leave the last big friendship diatribe to the end of the video. I'll try not to repeat myself too much here. I travel to the Northern Water Tribe. Looks like Roku's waterbending master is wearing something similar to a betrothal necklace here, just like Han was. Huh, maybe that is commonplace. Waterbending was especially challenging for me. Obvious one, but Roku struggles with waterbending because it's the one opposite of fire in the Avatar cycle. The same concept to why Aang struggled with earthbending. But in time, I mastered it as well. If you pause here, you can see that Roku actually made a little ice platform to brace himself on just to completely attempt to kill his master here. My earthbending master said was uncompromising, stubborn, and blunt. I'm pretty sure I already mentioned this in an earlier episode, but I'll be inundated with comments if I don't mention it here. Sud bears a very close resemblance to the shadowy earthbender in the intro to the show, probably the closest resemblance out of anyone. It was bitter work. But the results were worth it. This is one of the coolest shots in the entire show, and Roku actually says the title of a previous training episode, Bitter Work, in reference to completing his own training, which is super cool. Earlier we saw five, like, scroll holding things on this table, and if this is the empty one that Zuko took Sozin's last testament out of, then where'd the fifth one go? Roku! It's that girl who didn't even know you were alive. That is a funny way to phrase it, Aang. I don't know, though. Every time it showed her and Roku in the same scene, she seemed pretty bashful. It's cool that it seems like there's people from all four nations present at Roku's wedding. We've got all the different colors that represent them in this crowd here. Even some airbender orange. And an even better shot of the other three nations right here. You know what's interesting? I don't think Roku's wedding took place in the Fire Nation capital. I always just assumed that it had, but in this shot, we don't see the ring of the giant volcano that the city sits in. On top of that, it's sunset in this shot, and the Fire Nation capital looks towards the east if you're looking at towards the water. So I wonder where this is in the Fire Nation. Obviously the West Coast, but it seems like Roku probably lived here for a time if he's getting married here. We should share this prosperity with the rest of the world. In our hands is the most successful empire in history. It's time we expanded it. I can buy that, honestly. We've seen Sozin be largely good-natured and opportunistic to this point, which helps make this feel more gray than just a straight turn to evil. I don't think Sozin had bad intentions with this plan when it started, but obviously things change. Don't do this, Sozin. Don't challenge me. It will only end badly. Oh shit, hold on, Sozin's nuts? That's a lot of fire for a non combat enhanced bender. That's some Jong Jong shit. This is one of my favorite little details that goes totally unmentioned and can totally go over a viewer's head. Have you noticed that Sozin's throne room isn't the throne room that we've become acquainted with the Fire Lord using? Sozin has a more traditional one when compared to the burning one that Azulon and Oza use. And you wanna know why? It's because Roku fucking obliterates Sozin's throne room right here, and they had to make a new one. Even a single step out of line will result in your permanent end. 
Oh, it's going to be tricky getting him down from there, isn't it? Sozin and I didn't speak or see each other for 25 years after our battle. All right, this is a big one. You've got to focus up here. You've got to dial in because this isn't going to be the easiest thing to follow in the world. I've done the math, and it turns out that Sozin is very, very old when he dies. Like, older than you would think. All right, so lock in. Here we go. At the start of this episode, it's shown that Roku and Sozin share a birthday. They're 16 at the start of the episode. Sozin then states Roku didn't return home for 12 years while he traveled and learned the elements, making them both 28 at the time Roku marries, and Sozin proposes the expansion of the Fire Nation. The next time skip is only revealed to be, quote, many years, but looking at the two physically, graying hair and wrinkles, I'd think around the 40 to 45 years old range would be a fair guess, and that's undershooting it, if anything. So it's around that age that they have their duel in the throne room. The final time skip is 25 years, according to Roku, putting them both at 65 at the youngest at the time of Roku's death. Aang lives out the first 12 years of his life with only the idea of war being on the horizon, and Aang is born immediately when Roku dies. Aang freezes himself in an iceberg at 12 years old, making Sozin 77 at the time. I'll assume that the comet arrives very shortly after Aang runs away, within a year. It could be more, but we're trying to give Sozin the benefit of the doubt here. So that puts Sozin at the age of 77 at the youngest when the comet arrives. Okay, now here's the real shit. In the episode Zuko alone, we're shown Zuko, around the age of 10, at the end of the reign of Fire Lord Azulon, Sozin's son. So that places these events around 5 or 6 years before Aang comes out of the ice, which is agreed to be 100 years. So this is about 95 years after Aang goes in the ice. At Azulon's funeral, it's said that Azulon served as Fire Lord for 23 years, until his death, setting the precedent that the Fire Lord rules until his death. Meaning, 95 years, subtracting the 23 years of Azulon's rule, leaves us with 72 years of Sozin still ruling as Fire Lord after he leaves Roku to die. That puts Sozin, at his youngest, remember I've undershot everything to a reasonable amount, at 149 years old at the time of his death. And yes, I know this has been retconned, the creators made Azulon's rule way longer with some hindsight, but I'm not analyzing what the creators edited after the fact. I'm talking about the 61 episodes they put in front of us, so I don't care to hear about this retcon talk. I like that even though they show Roku having seriously aged here, they immediately have him leap out of bed and get into position to show he's not some feeble old man. Good visual storytelling. Okay, this is a really weird thing to include, right? It very specifically shows the royal artifact being left here on the ground as both Roku and Tom in flee their home, and only minutes after this, their home is buried in volcanic ash. Roku's got his hands full this whole time, so unless Tom in remembers her husband's headpiece and turns around to go get it, they're for running towards an actively exploding volcano. I don't see any way for this to not be buried along with the town but Iroh has it at the end of the episode, so why include this shot? It's really strange. This scene is great. We haven't gotten to see a fully realized Avatar strut their stuff since Kiyoshi, and since we're more familiar with Roku, it feels even better. A really cool payoff to seeing a summarized version of Roku's Avatar journey. You'll also notice that in this shot, Roku didn't just make a way to the top of the volcano with this move, he actually raised a whole ass wall. I think we could have probably shown that a little better, but it's still a cool feat for Roku. This is amazing, Roku. You're battling a volcano. And you're winning! I agree, the spectacle is really cool, but this scene is pretty horribly undercut by the fact that Aang also battled a volcano with the objective of saving a town, and he actually survived and saved the town. And he was just an airbender, and a fledgling waterbender, I guess. He did have some things working for him, though, as he got to plan before it erupted, it seemed like a much less violent eruption. The town seemed further away, and there wasn't an entire ass second volcano. But the way Aang phrases it still makes Roku seem kinda lame. Fuck, that's a cool shot. God, the spectacle is incredible in these last few minutes. I'm not gonna lie. Need a hand, old friend? I like that in this shot, Sozin shows up and literally covers the second volcano, as if the shot is trying to tell us that Sozin has that one covered. This show is a really cool language it speaks in when it comes to blocking shots. Here we get some more Roku lava bending, which we first saw him do back in book one in the spirit form. Cool to see him do it in life, too. This is the biggest meme form of bending in the entire show. This is a form of fire bending? Somehow? What is this? What is he even doing? He's stealing the heat from the lava in the form of volcanic fumes? This just doesn't track, man. And even if it does somehow scientifically, it doesn't track with this somehow being firebending. I'll tell you that much. Please. Without you, all my plans are suddenly possible. I have a vision for the future, Roku. I'm not the first one to point this out, but Sozin's betrayal here mirrors the first scene we see these two share. Sozin goes to help Roku, catches him, but ultimately lets him fall. It's a pretty cool little detail. Sozin also has a blue dragon, by the way, which plays back into the imagery of Zuko's dream back in book two. The red dragon was the angel on his shoulder, Roku's dragon, and the blue one was the devil, Sozin's dragon. That's a really nice touch. Of course, these dragons are both related to Zuko because of a reveal we get later in the episode, so we'll get to that in a sec. 
Overall, I think Sozin was a great character, well fleshed out, and despite his heel turn on Roku seeming a little quick, once again, we've got 24 minutes in an episode. We gotta get this shit done. Was he a bad guy in the end? Yeah, what he did was messed up. But like all great villains, we can kind of see where he's coming from to an extent. So I think his character works really well. <laughs> Ah, come on, dude. That shit's sad as hell. Fang was ride or die, man. Literally. Interesting to note that these look like female air nomads. So unless these guys came to the southern air temple to help deliver Aang, Aang was either born at the eastern or western air temple. You have more than one great grandfather, Prince Zuko. Sozin was your father's grandfather. Your mother's grandfather was Avatar Roku. This reveal is so good, man. What an awesome angle to take. It enforces the struggle between good and evil and Zuko so much more, and it just ties together parts of the story that you wouldn't think would be intertwined. This is masterful storytelling, and just amazing scene writing as well, the way it builds up to Iroh saying it. And I finally get to talk about the cinematography in these prison scenes Zuko and Iroh share too. Not just in this episode, but this episode especially. Most of the time the shot is framed from within Iroh's cell, so it looks like Zuko is the one that's in prison. There are a lot of shots of Iroh behind bars too, but most of the shots actually zoom in through the bars. On the flip side, a lot of the shots do the opposite for Zuko. They zoom out to show the bars in front of him. This is a metaphor to show Zuko's mental imprisonment in this broken cycle of hate and anger he's found himself in, while Iroh was free of it and on the other side of the bars that can find Zuko. Look at this shot especially. If you didn't know the situation here, who would you say is in prison? Zuko is the one behind bars, and the light and Iroh are just beyond them. He's the one that needs to break free. What happened generations ago can be resolved now by you. Because of your legacy, you alone can cleanse the sins of our family. And only on this shot, when Iroh explains the role Zuko can still play, does the zoom in on Zuko's frame start. He begins to realize he can break free. Not totally yet, as we cut away before the bars are totally out of shot, but he's starting to see it. The way the camera works on this scene is simply brilliant. It's amazing. Roku was just as much Fire Nation as Sozin was, right? If anything, their story proves anyone's capable of great good and great evil. I like that Aang has his own take on his vision here. I don't think that point was pushed very hard at all in the narrative, but it's cool that Aang had the chance to take it that way. I like that a lot. Do you really think friendships can last more than one lifetime? I don't see why not. Now that I can agree with. Fuck yeah, Aang, you got a good squad here. This episode is amazing. I know a lot of people who say it's their favorite. We get a cool bite-sized version of an avatar journey of a character we already think is really cool, and we learn a lot more about him. The themes of friendship and growth and responsibility are rife throughout the entire show, but this episode is a highlight of all of them. I really, really buy Roku and Sosin's friendship and falling out, even though we only spend less than half an hour watching them. It stops this episode from just being a lore dump when you frame it around a really close friendship falling apart. It makes it feel personal. And on top of that, of course, it's very visually appealing, and it's really nice to finally see where everything changed from the Fire Nation attack really started from. Patron shoutouts, if you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. The Don't Tier, Agent Rhino and Garrett Kane, you guys are insane. You madmen, you complete lunatics, you maniacs, you psychopaths. Are you enjoying the perk of me calling you synonyms for crazy? Is that worth all that money? Nah, I should probably think of something better. Of course, shoutouts to my other top patrons, Bradley Ralph, who went up to space and turned those billionaires right around. Donnie Snow, who sees the world in big head mode like he's playing a game of NBA Jam. Dylan Calvo, who has a walk-in closet that's bigger than your parents' house. Elder Zeldenthis, who can grow hair anywhere, like on the ground or on the wall and shit too. Kennedy Stapleton, who figured out math. All of it. Lou Carrera, who bakes pastries for homeless lepers. Mandatory Sin, who went to one of those sensory deprivation pods, and since then, he just keeps saying that he's ascended. Max Lewandowski, who was double jointed on every joint. That's like over 700 joints, I think. Mike the Wizard, who died and went to heaven, but he got bored, so he came back. Nick Kaipanen, who can tell what breed a dog is just by the way it barks. Sad Wallet Noises, who figured out a duplication glitch in real life. Skylos, who was in an ancient Egyptian time loop. Let's just hope they don't open up that tomb, buddy. Useless Princess Backwards, who can actually only speak and spell backwards, so I feel bad about saying it that way. Tiago Nascimento, who can smile so bright it lights up a room. Literally, it's like a flashlight. Varunda, who can bench press the French press, so look out, paparazzi of France. Will Schmidt, who is only in his caterpillar form, just wait until he kicks it into moth mode. And Zumpy, who can do every TikTok dance all at once in one second. It kills him if he does it, but he can do it. And more shoutouts go to my top patrons. Andrew Edwards, Bra Man from the Fifth Floor, Buddha Jacker, Caps Lock, Charlie Rock Quigley, Daniel Ward, Eric Barney, etc. Fetch Me Something Gay, Fritz Sullivan, Jess, John, 
John, Keith Glasson, Phantom Lord Daddy, Sean Martin, and you freaking nerd. And of course, my god analyzers, Alex Fritz, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Brand Muffin, Bingo Dingo, Cabbage Gal, Canon Corpse, Kevin Yagi, Chase Brignac, Chris Stolmeth, David Carlisle, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Dr. Uwu, Dom X Saint, Distant, Earth 2 John, Eleonora Rose, Epic Goomba, Eric Ross, X Meyer, Ginny from the Block, Glintlock, Gub Gub, Haystone, Homie Juan Kenobi, Hype King, It's Carton, Jay Lambo, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Jop Moreland, Joshua Hashkit, Juice Pouch, Grape, Kadex, Keon Gilliland, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Lord Draken, 7367, Mr. Airborne, Mitchell Gobrecht, Mortius 007, Nicholas Abbott, Omar, Parker Malarker, Peyton Mims, Peter Bayron, Radiator Rat, Rocket Mist, Shadow Fox Nero, Stein One, Super Snipper, Tiny Knight, Tom Hanks, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juice, Uncle Iroh, Whales Red, and Wolfman Dan. Next up is The Runaway. That's a fun one.